is panhandling Wall Street style. Brother, can you spare 700 billion? An overview. I'm going to first talk about the underlying cause of the financial meltdown, which is on everybody's mind these days. And that can be summarized in one word, derivatives. I'm going to say what a derivative is, what kinds of them there are out there, and how many have been created. And to show the nature of the problem, I'm going to focus on one type, the credit default swap, which I'll explain. I'm going to give a hypothetical illustration of fire insurance in the form of a credit default swap, a real-world example involving Lehman Brothers, and finish up with what issue these present to policymakers. What is a derivative? Derivatives are created by contracts made between any two financial institutions. They typically run hundreds of pages in length, and they are designed to hedge economic risk. The contract specifies what each side of the contract will give in an event posing material financial risk. The institution at each end of the contract is called a counterparty. Typical derivative is written for a fee expressed as a percentage of the face or notional value of the contract. And here's an important point. By design of our government, there is no central clearinghouse, no central reporting, and no disclosure of derivatives. You might wonder why our government would do that. And they're probably wondering the same thing right now. Derivatives come in various categories. There are derivatives written on mortgage securities, credit default swaps, currency swaps, interest rate swaps, equity swaps, and derivatives on derivatives. For example, collateralized debt obligations or collateralized debt obligations squared, a derivative of the first. By the best reckoning we can come up with, since it's voluntary to disclose this, there are about a thousand trillion dollars worth of these derivatives in the market worldwide right now. That's a fantastical number. And this is double the value they represented in 2007. By comparison, the enti entire gross domestic product of the world is only 60 trillion. The U.S. residential real estate market is 23 trillion. All U.S. stock markets are 15 trillion. And all world stock markets have a value of 50 trillion. So a thousand trillion or a quadrillion is quite a number. Now it's true this fantastic amount is notional and its real economic effect would be far less once all deals are netted out. But in order for there not to be a problem, counterparties have to survive. And we see the counterparties are blowing up every day. So if only 1% default rate occurred on these contracts, that would leave the other end of the contract exposed to $10 trillion worth of economic risk. Now this chart shows liquidity in the world, that is the availability of credit and money. This is at the beginning of 2007, and remember, derivatives have doubled since 2007, so this chart will understate their importance. Down the left-hand side of the chart, we have a percentage of liquidity created by central banks is 1%. By the broad money supply, 11%. By securitized debt, 13%. And derivatives account for 75% of the world's liquidity, which is why when derivatives seized up as they have recently, we have a credit crunch. And, as I said, that chart was at the beginning of 07. So if they're 75% at the beginning of 07, they're probably 90% now, derivatives, as a percentage of world liquidity. To illustrate the potentially devastating financial consequences of derivatives, I'm going to focus on one form of them, called a credit default swap. There were 55 trillion of these at the end of 2008. A credit default swap is insurance, but unlike ordinary insurance, the issue is not issuer is not regulated like an insurance company would be. A typical credit default swap is written for five years for a fee of 3 to 5% of the notional value, or the face value. 
So to insure $100 million worth of uh, marginal bonds that an insurance company or a pension fund might want to buy, but was below investment grade, so needed to be upgraded, they might buy a credit default swap for an annual premium of $5 million, or $25 million over the life of the contract to insure $100 million of those bonds, which explains why people were attracted to them. This is, if, as long as the counterparties survive, this money goes right to the bottom line as an insurance premium. And uh, that's exactly what AIG did. AIG was a AAA rated insurance company, so unlike most counterparties, did not have to post any collateral. And they, they made great profits as long as the financial markets didn't uh, melt down by selling credit default swaps. Now this term was chosen specifically because it doesn't include the word insurance. And that enables the institutions who wrote them to avoid insurance regulation. Now that could be arguable, but these were important and influential financial institutions, so they got away with it. So the seller of a credit default swap does not have to meet specific regulated reserve requirements to cover payment in the event of a default that he's insuring. And the buyer does not have to have what the insurance industry calls an insurable risk. In addition, there is no regulator keeping an eye on the volume of and risk created by these instruments. Compounding the risk, investors buy credit default swaps from highly leveraged hedge funds or investment banks with enormous leverage ratios of 30 or 40 to 1. That means there's 30 units of debt for every unit of equity. That means the sellers have very little in the way of equity to cover the risk they are insuring. Now remember, the Great Depression was caused by margin in the stock market at 10 to 1 leverage. And we're three, four, five times higher than that with credit default swaps. When Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers failed, they roiled the financial markets because of the credit default swaps they had outstanding that then exposed the other end of those insurance policy, so to speak, to uncovered economic risk. That they